first ever session of vermicomposting, Worms Ate My Food Scraps. We're really excited that you guys are here. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Emily, and I am the Public Outreach Coordinator at the Addison County Solid Waste Management District. And this is? Hi, I'm Gabby. I'm the Eco AmeriCorps member at the Addison County Solid Waste Management District. Yeah, we're really excited for this lesson today. Um, so briefly, before we get started, we'll go over what we'll cover. So first, we'll go over what is vermicomposting. Then we'll go over the difference between vermicomposting worms and the invasive species that you might hear about lately. We'll then move on to feeding and bedding. Then how to build a worm bin, harvesting your worm bin, the tips and best practices for having a worm bin, and any troubleshooting advice. So first and foremost, vermicomposting is using worms to turn food scraps into what we call castings. It is essentially worm excrement or their poop, but it is entirely nutrient rich and super fertile for your soil. The right worm castings can improve your soil structure, it can improve the water and retention, and it can add nutrients to your soil. I'd like to clarify that vermicomposting is a different system than typical backyard composting. If you buy vermicomposting worms and add them to your backyard composting, you'll often find that they will disappear. Um, that's because vermicomposting worms are meant to be in a compact system, like our examples to the right, not so much in an outdoor, open to the world system. Um, vermicomposting is a good complement to an outdoor compost pile. You'll find that vermicomposting, um, the worms will eat some of your food scraps, but not all. So it's great to have another system in addition to your vermicompost bin, just to make sure that all of your food waste is being broken down. Um, but it's great. It is a great way to get rid of some of your excess food waste. So before we move on, I'll talk briefly on worms just in Vermont in general. So 12,000 years ago, Vermont was clover covered in glacial ice, um, which killed almost all native worm species here. So of the 19 species of worms that are present in Vermont, none of them are native but there is a distinction, non-native does not necessarily mean they are an invasive species or they are a harmful species. Some species add nutrients to the soil and some remove. You might hear lately a lot of talk about jumping worms, which are invasive worm species present in Vermont. They are a growing problem and they do remove nutrients from the soil. You'll see here two pictures of a forest. On the left is one without earthworms. Um, you can see it has a really rich understory. There are a lot of plants present. Um, there's a lot of nutrients there for those understory plants to grow. Whereas on the right, in a forest that has been impacted by jumping worms, there's almost no understory plants present. Um, and that's because jumping worms do eat the O or the humus layer of the soil. And when they leave their castings, their castings are not nutrient dense, they're not nutrient rich. Um, they bioaccumulate all of those nutrients inside of them, which causes a lack of understory growth. So these three worms are the invasive jumping worms. Um, they are not worms for composting. This is M. Hilgendorfi, A. agrestis, and A. tokyoensis, with M. Hilgendorfi being about four inches to six inches in size. A. agrestis being about two to six inches, and A. tokyoensis being one to four inches. We bring these worms up because they're often in people's backyard compost piles, and some people get confused, and they think that seeing these worms in their backyard compost is healthy for it because it means that they might be vermicomposting or composting successfully. This isn't true. Um, these are species that we want to look out for and not have in a backyard compost pile. This is, yes, so <laughs> this is how you tell the difference. Um, you're going to look for a worm that is roughly 1.5 inches to eight inches, primarily gray or a brown worm. Their most similar relative um, in looks at least is the European nightcrawler species, but there is a pretty big difference between them. These worms will thrash about underground. Um, so if you remove some leaf litter or see them in your compost pile, they will most notably be having snake-like movements or wild thrashing movements. They really look like they are jumping about all crazy. Um, and that is a very telltale sign that you have the invasive jumping worms. If you're still unsure, the other thing that is different between these three species and common earthworms are their clitellum. Their clitellum is known as the band that goes all the way around the worm. On invasive jumping worms, it is flat, 
and it is often pale pink in color. Pale pink in color. It can be gray um, or flesh color of the skin, but it is um, flush to the skin. It is not raised around the worm itself, whereas on a common earthworm, it might be slightly raised around their rest of the body. So to manage the invasive jump worms, you're first and foremost going to want to buy your worms from a trusted source. Since worms are not native in Vermont, um, you're mainly going to be looking at either bait shacks or online sources for worms and you're going to want to make sure that you have the correct species. So make sure that you are not buying any of the ferritimoid species um, or the jumping worms. You're also going to want to install bare root plants or grow plants from seed. If you buy plants or borrow plants from someone that does have soil surrounding it, there's a chance that the jumping worm cocoons are in there and that's mainly how they are spreading. The cocoons do overwinter in Vermont, whereas the worms themselves do not. The worms will die off come the first frost so we're really primarily concerned about the cocoons, um, and the cocoons look almost identical to soil. So it's really hard to tell if you have them, but if you have seen the worms on your property, it's a good idea to only give out bare root plants or plant seeds. Um, do not transport any materials that you know are contaminated by these invasive species. Now we'll move on to the worms for vermicomposting. So this is a completely different species. We are looking at red wiggler worms, Icenia fetida. Some people will try to vermicompost with Indian blues or nightcrawler species. These two do eat your food waste, but they don't have as wide of a palate as Icenia fetida. So make sure that you're buying pure Icenia fetida when getting these worms. Um, they do live in the upper layers of soil, which is perfect for these very compact systems. Other worms might be burrowers. They might burrow up to six feet underground like night crawlers. Um, that doesn't exactly work when you're dealing with a compact vermicomposting system, such as the ones to our right. Um, those are not six feet in size, so those worms will be unhappy. But since Icenia fetida live on the upper layers of soil, they are pretty happy in those environments. They also thrive in an ideal temperature range of about 55 degrees Fahrenheit to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So it can be done indoors or outdoors, but in the coldest months of winter here, you're going to have to bring them inside. And in the hottest months of summer, you're also going to have to bring them inside. But since it's very compact, it's pretty easy to keep them in a garage or other place that is temperature controlled. And for the size of your vermicomposting bin, the metric is about one pound of worms per square foot that you have. So now a little bit about the feeding of the worms. Um, this is why we have the vermicomposting worms, most likely to get rid of food that you have. Um, and how many um, or how much your uh, food your worms will eat is going to depend greatly on the environmental conditions that they're in. It's also going to depend on the species that you use. So one of the reasons why Icenia fetida is so great is because it does have a wider palate, like Emily said, um, compared to a lot of other species of worms. Um, in their most ideal conditions, uh, red wiggler worms are going to eat half of their weight in food every day. So if you have a pound of worms, then it should eat about a half a pound of food every day. And you don't have to feed them necessarily every day. We say ideally once a week to every two days works fine. Um, and just a note, um, which I'll cover a little bit more in a bit more detail later, what you're gonna wanna do is to make sure that you only add food to one layer if you have a multi-layer bin or one half of a bin if you only have a single bin um, at a time. This is just gonna make harvesting tastings a lot easier for you later on. And we could talk about that more in a bit. So what do worms like to eat? Worms are almost vegan, <laughs> more or less. Mostly what they're going to be eating is fruits and vegetable scraps. Um, worms do have a favorite food. Um, it happens to be watermelon or cantaloupe. Any kind of melon is something that a worm will absolutely eat first. Um, and then on the other hand, they will eat most other fruits and vegetable scraps, but you wanna be careful because some are damaging to uh, the worms themselves and some are probably going to produce an odor. Um, so ideally, or typically, cruciferous vegetables like broccoli or asparagus are going to produce an odor when they break down. And if that is bothersome to you, you may want to not include those in your typical vermicomposting setup. 
So these are a sometimes food. These are things that you absolutely can throw in your vermicomposting bin, but you wanna be careful and you wanna make sure that you're not including too much of it. Mostly because while a worm will eat this, it won't eat it in large quantities. And so you may just have it sitting in your bin. Um, coffee grounds, tea, as long as the tea bag is paper and not plastic. Um, plain pasta and rice. It's important that the plain that the pasta is plain and does not have a sauce on it um, because depending on what kind of sauce you use, that may have a lot of oils or meat in it and that wouldn't be good for your bin. Um, you can use raw potato peels in smaller quantities. Bread is absolutely fine and crushed eggshells are great both as a food and as bedding for your worms. And then here are some items that we absolutely never want to put in a vermicomposting bin for a few reasons. Um, it shouldn't be much of a surprise that things like meat, fish, and dairy shouldn't go in your vermicomposting bin, partially because your worms are not really going to want to eat that. They don't necessarily like to break those kinds of foods down, partially because it can be more of an enticement for um, pests to come visit your bin if you've got just meat sitting out and rotting, and partially because if nobody eats the food, it's going to smell, and you absolutely don't want that in your vermicomposting bin, especially if it's inside your home. Um, there are some foods that are uh, damaging to worms, partially because worms have highly sensitive skin. So anything that's very acidic or very strong in nature, it might hurt your worms. So that would be things like garlics, leeks, onions, um, citrus, and pineapple. Pineapple in large quantities can be poisonous to worms as well. Um, and spicy or pickled foods or foods with a lot of vinegar should be left out of your bin because your worms will not be able to digest it and it could hurt them. So your worms are going to eat the food that you give them, um, but they're also going to eat their bedding. So in nature, worms need a substrate. That substrate is going to help keep them moist. It's going to protect them from the sun. It's going to help them move around, and it's also going to help them digest their food. Um, in nature, that substrate is soil, pretty simple. Um, but in a vermicomposting system, that substrate is what we call bedding. And your bedding can be made out of a lot of different types of material. Um, shredded newspaper, cardboard, and egg cartons work great. Um, you can also use shredded chemical-free paper towels. Um, one thing to note is that you don't want to put any kind of paper products in there that are glossy or shiny. Um, anything that's very heavily dyed or has heavy inks that are not natural wouldn't be good for your worms and it probably wouldn't be good for your castings that you're ideally going to use on your plants either. Um, and another thing that you can add as bedding is leaves and soil. Leaves and soil actually work absolutely fantastic because they contain a lot of the natural uh, microorganisms that are going to be good for your plants and that are going to be good for your worms. So throwing in a handful of leaves or more and maybe even a little bit of soil will just help get that pile going. Another note about the bedding is that it needs to be damp. Um, worms like to have moisture in their skin. Um, so you want to make sure that it's not super soaking wet and you also don't want it bone dry. We like to say that the ideal moisture ratio is, is going to have the texture of a wrung out sponge. Um, and you should make sure that it's thoroughly incorporated throughout all of your bedding, not just necessarily at the top. So now we're going to talk a little bit about setting up a worm bin. There are two main kinds of worm bins, one which is on Emily's side is going to be a multi-tiered worm bin. Um, this is great. You can purchase one at the store or you can make one yourself. Um, these are a little bit more complicated to make, but they do make harvesting the castings a lot easier. Um, they also sometimes come with an additional spout, which is excellent for getting that worm tea just a tiny bit easier. Um, and you can have multiple layers going at once. Um, on my side, you have the single layer worm bin. It kind of just looks like a big plastic storage bin. These are a lot easier to make yourself. They're not terribly fancy, um, but they do work just as well. The only thing is that they are a tiny bit harder to harvest the castings from, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, and one thing that you want to make sure, no matter what worm bin you choose, is that it is at least a cubic foot in size. Um, you want to do this because you want to make sure that your worms have enough room. Um, and ideally, you're going to need about a pound of worms anyway, which you would need a, half, a cubic foot for that. Okay, so no matter what bin you choose, they're always going to have the same four components. The first is darkness. It's very important that these bins have a lid. Um, they don't necessarily need to be kept in a dark room, but making sure that they do not have sunlight streaming down on them or um, an unnatural light streaming down on them because the worms really do need that darkness to protect their skin. 
Um, that is also why when you build a worm bin, you use a dark plastic container and not a clear plastic container, um, just to give that worms that added um, darkness and privacy. Um, it also needs ventilation. <laughs> Some people forget that worms do actually need to breathe. Um, we'll show you a little bit how we add ventilation to a homemade bin, but generally when you buy a bin, you will also see that there are lots of holes drilled on the side just to let that air flow in. You will also need drainage. Ideally, you won't be producing a ton of water in your vermicomposting bin, but there will definitely be some, especially if you're spraying it regularly or if you're throwing in particularly wet food scraps. So you're going to need a place for that water to go. Um, that water is excellent for putting on your plants, but it's not so great for your worms because they need to breathe, and so only a damp environment will do. They can't be saturated with water. Um, and then size, like I mentioned, it needs to be about a cubic foot at the least. Okay, so that being said, let's make a bin. <laughs> so um, here we have two pretty basic um, plastic containers. This is an example of a store-bought bin that we have. It's yeah. multi-tiered. It also has a spout, although the spout is broken. <laughs> um, and we'll put up a picture for you all to see later. Um, you can buy, if you want to add it to your own personal bin, a spout and just drill it into the side. Um, we won't do that today, but it is something that you can add if it seems like it would be a big help for you guys. Um, but as long as you're managing the bin itself for moisture content, it's not necessary to have a spout on there unless you really do want that liquid coming from your worms. Yeah. Yeah. So what we're going to be making today, um, just quickly, is going to be a single layer bin. It's going to be two bins stacked on top of each other, where the bottommost bin is where all of the liquid is going to drain into, and the topmost bin is going to be where the worms are going to live. Um, this would be technically a single layer bin with just an extra step. Um, however, if you wanted to make this a multi-layer bin, you could just by adding more plastic containers on top and just working on it that way. Um, but let's get started, all right? Yeah. Um, so while you set that up, I might explain what a multi-layered bin looks like. So this is our example one. Um, we've been composting with this at the district transfer station and in my apartment for a little bit of time. Um, it lived at the transfer station until it got cold outside and then it needed to come inside, so it came home with me. Um, the top layer is what we are currently adding to. Um, so that is the layer of bedding. So what we use for bedding is primarily um, newspaper and leaves. So this is the newspaper. It does get saturated and then I'll lift this up. It will look like that as the worms start breaking it down a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So what Gabby is doing here is drilling in holes for drainage in the bottom of the bin. She's going about um, a half an inch to an inch apart, and she is using a one-fourth quarter drill bit to do that. It's pretty simple to do if you have a drill. And then you'll see she's kind of trying to mimic that on the bottom there where there's holes for the drainage for the worms. <laughs> layer you're going to want to have enough holes so that the worms can actually travel through from bin to bin and I'll show you how that's done in a minute. Yep, last one. Last one. <laughs> For the All right. Way. So um, these are the quarter inch holes. There's not terribly many, but this is actually going to allow for the drainage so that you have a um, not a lot of moisture building up in your pile um, so that your pile doesn't become uh, anaerobic. But also if I was going to do a multi-layer bin, this would help the worms to be able to travel between bins. And they definitely do, which you could see when they Emily do on this one. Out. When if I lift this up, you might be able to see some in the holes there. Yeah. So ideally, the holes will allow for that travel. Um, it's not necessary, but it's great to have. Um, and then around the edges here, Gabby is going to load in 
an eighth um, drill bit and then drain or drill around the edge for ventilation. This store-bought bin has ventilation already added in around the edges there. The key for ventilation is you want to have a size that the worms can't get through. So we don't want the worms to escape. So that allows for them to breathe, but um, not escape your system. Okay. So when I go around with the drill bit, what I'm going to do is kind of do a crisscrossing pattern, and it only needs to be on this area that's completely visible. Um, so you don't need a ton, but it definitely is important. Oh, I see what the issue is. But it definitely is important that the worms get adequate airflow. And I don't know if we said this, but um, the winner of the raffle prize will get to take home this bin with them. So does it matter how the depth of the post of the, the size of the bin? So, yeah, so when we were looking for bins, we wanted a tub that was between 10 gallons to 18 gallons. We're going to be putting in about half a pound of worms into there, hoping that they will reproduce. Um, so 18 gallons is probably the maximum you want for your worms, and then 10 gallons is the minimum. Um, and that just has to do with the worms moving out. They don't really like being on top of each other. Um, sometimes they like their space. So if you're doing a one bin system, you wanna make sure that there's enough room for them. So in this one, we started with a pound. There is about one and a half to two pounds in here right now. We did purchase some more specifically for these workshops, knowing that we would take some worms out of here and move them into there. Um, but they do reproduce. So we did notice some baby worms over the summer, which was really cute to see and meant that we were doing an okay job at managing the system. <laughs> But if you do have the right environment for them, you will find that they are reproducing. So some people, if they have a one bin system, they'll notice that uh, they need to kind of expand after a little bit. So that's why we're setting up with a um, 14 gallon uh, bucket, basically for half a pound of worms, just to make sure that there's wiggle room. Um, so if they do rep reproduce, they still have enough space. Uh, not difficult. Um, yeah, I can show you. So the spigot itself just looks like this. It would be basically just finding the right size drill bit that matches the spigot that you purchase. And then it does have some washers here. So one washer would go inside your bin and the other one would go on the spigot itself. And it would be that. We got this on Amazon. Um, we purchased two for about $5. <laughs> So, pretty good deal. Um, the one on our bin over here, it looks like that. It's also just kind of installed roughly into the bottom of the bin because if the drainage is working, ideally all of the liquid would flow to that bottom level. Um, and then it's warm tea, basically. And that is very nutrient rich as well. So, that's the holes in the bin. You wanna do bedding now? I am not adept at power tools, so the fact that I can <laughs> Uh, so, so yeah, moving on, we'll load in the bedding, which is primarily going to be newspaper here, shredded. So shredding you can do with a typical paper shredder, or you can just take your hands. You're going to want it to be uh, pretty tiny, roughly like this, just so the worms can move through it. You'll find with larger pieces, um, there might be some compaction in there, which would lead to anaerobic decomposition of that paper itself, which is not ideal in this system. So we also want to have a tinier size so the worms can. Um, and then in addition to the newspaper, we're going to add in some leaves. Um, but one thing about the newspaper, like we said before, it does have to be really wet. So we have our warm water here. 
And we're just going to kind of spritz that all over the bin until it is the right texture. Um, when we say wrung out sponge, we don't mean freshly wrung out sponge. We're talking more like sitting on your kitchen countertop for about two hours. When you go to feel it and it's still slightly wet, that's really what we're looking for. That's the ideal conditions. Can I throw in some leaves? Yeah. This is just tap water. This is fine. Um, it doesn't really make a difference. The worms are typically um, outdoors, and some areas of the United States have acid rain. So the acidity in water or chlorine or any of that, that's not really going to matter in here. It's absolutely fine to just use your kitchen sink water. And whole leaves are fine if you want to add them as bedding. Um, although the best thing to do would be to crumple uh, crinkle them up or even go over them so that they're all broken up and smashed. It's just because leaves are kind of large and flat and what you don't want is for them to pancake down and create these flat layers where there's no airflow. Uh, worms really do need oxygen just like anything else and so a lot of the problems that you might see in a vermicomposting bin will come from not enough airflow. Is that good on I'd say that's good, yeah. All right, so now we have that base layer of bedding here. I'll go up, oh, oops. I'll just tip this over and show you guys. So it looks like that. Pretty easy, simple to make. Um, once we have that, we can add in some worms. So I might, for ease of access, I'm just going to move this closer to here because I am going to transfer some worms from this bin to this one. <laughs> So I'm just going to take from our pre-made bedding here up a bit and make sure that there's plenty of worms in there. So we got our red wigglers online, um, which is something that you can do. You just, again, want to make sure that you're finding the right species. But they shipped within about a week. Um, and the seller herself did give us some little worm packets of food for them. So this one is oyster shell flour, and then we also have what they call worm chow. I don't think it is necessary to have any fancy food like that for them. Um, if you're feeding them vegetables, that's fine. But there is a recommendation of when you get your worms online, they might be in shock when you first get them. So definitely wait at least a day to two days before feeding them. But you're going to want to have your bed ready for them first. I'm gonna put uh, a little bit more bedding just on top of them so that they're in okay. the dark. Yeah. yeah, and they do really not like the light, so you'll even see when we open up this bin here, they are already burrowing underneath into their bedding just because harsh lights is not their favorite thing. They really like to be in the dark. All right, cool. so that's them in there. <laughs> <laughs> and then dark tough because no light is ideal. Yes, they really do not like it. We have a little bit of food for them as we well. We do. Um, and this is just to show they really, really, <laughs> they are very particular when it comes to their food. A lot of fresh vegetables are best. Um, you don't want to throw in anything that is acidic that will hurt them. Um, I just yeah. say that so again. we have lettuce here for them. Do we want to add? Yeah. yeah. So in here, we're just going to add the lettuce only to one side of the bin. I'm adding it to the rightmost side. That's because you only want to feed in this style system one side at a time. And you're going to want to make sure that those food waste, those food scraps, it's burrowed underneath the bedding because they will not eat it unless it is buried in there. Chunk size doesn't necessarily matter. If you're noticing that the worms aren't eating your food, you might want to cut it up. But um, we've put in entire half of watermelons into these systems before, and they'll eat that completely fine. So banana peels, banana peels are fine as well. Actually, funnily enough, avocado pits, they won't necessarily eat them, um, but I, what I have read and heard and what I'm very excited to see if actually works 
um, is that you can get an avocado pit to sprout and get a little avocado tree much, much easier and at a much higher success rate if you just leave it in your worm bin for a few months. Um, yeah, I've heard that that's a great way if you want a lot of little avocado plants to just put it in the worm bin because they like the tastings a lot. What about avocado skins? Because they don't... I did notice, um, we did put in a sweet melon in there, and they ate the entire inside of the melon, but they left the rind. So I don't know if that's just the specific worms we have and their pickiness, but we did find that they ate the inside of the fruit and not the skin itself. So um, I said that I would explain a little bit on how to harvest it, and I'm going to go back over here <laughs> so that I can explain it a little bit better. Um, so harvesting is going to be pretty straightforward. Um, when it comes to a bin like this, you have multiple layers, so you can really just put food straight in the top right here and then leave these bottom layers for all of the worms to just migrate up. The worms are going to go where the food is, um, and it will take about a month for the worms to go completely from the layer that has the tastings to the layer that has all of the fresh food, um, but they should completely move up from the bottom layers of the bin into the new layer. After that month is up, you could just take this bottommost layer, take it off of your bin, use all of the tastings, and then put a new layer on top. It's pretty simple and straightforward. With this, it gets a little bit tricky. It's not hard, but you do want to make sure that you're not um, scooping up the worms as you harvest from the tastings. That's why we say only put the food scrap on one half of the bin. So it can either be this half, this half, this half, or this half, whatever's easier, but you're only going to put it on half of the bin. Uh, because there is no clear separation between the two halves of food scraps and tastings, um, you may notice that there are still some worms moving around. Um, a good way to make sure that you're getting just the tastings and no worms is to go slow, take small scoops out, and to shine a bright light on the half that has the tastings. Um, that's because the worms, they don't like light, so you can kind of use it to force them away or down or wherever they, you don't want them to be. Um, so just shining a light on it and taking small scoops, making sure to pick out any worms if you happen to see any still left is a good way to harvest these tastings. And it's not terribly hard. This is just a fancy way to do it. You can also maybe add the worm's favorite food to the other side and see if they'll all run over towards the melon or whatever you put in there. They will. <laughs> uh, and so this is just a top view in case it wasn't clear of what that vermicomposting bin looks like, the multi-layered. Um, we will sometimes keep one or two trays of just castings left over because as an office we don't use a ton of the castings. Um, but we will keep those layers of castings, then the top layers where we add the fresh food scraps. And that base has a small reservoir with a spout where we can collect the worm water. Um, so just a, a nice little top view for you. Moving on, we have your uses. So there are a lot of uses for worm castings, and they are often very similar to your uses for your traditional backyard compost. So first and foremost, they're great for transplanting plants. Um, you can use that worm tea. It's said to a one to three ratio worm tea to water is the ideal, and that would be a liquid fertilizer for your plants instead of the casting fertilizer. You can also spread it on as topsoil, or you can use it to feed your indoor plants. Um, we don't necessarily recommend mulch for this, mainly because the worms don't make that many castings, so it's more uh, small scale uses. It is, like we mentioned with the avocados, great for um, starter pots um, because it does get, um, has a lot of nutrients and it does get things to sprout. Um, if you're finding that you're not getting a lot of worm water or not enough worm water for your plants, you can also make uh, worm tea by just taking the castings, putting them in a cloth bag, and letting that soak in water, and then eventually you will be able to use that water to water your plants. Yep. Moving on, we have some best practices. So first and foremost, have your bin and bedding ready before you get your worms or quickly after. This is because if you have your worms either coming in the mail or you buy them from a bait shack, they need somewhere to go. Um, otherwise, you might find them rolling across your floor, um, as we found one time when our bin was not ready for them. Um, and then again, when you have your worms and you have them in the bin with the bedding ready, you're going to want to wait at least 24 hours before you put any food in there. Um, that's so they can get acclimated to their new environment. 
when the mer worms move from one place to another, they will almost be in shock. So it's important to keep that in mind and not scare them too much with new food, new place, um, new items. It's best for them to get acclimated. And then you're going to want to keep your worms in a temperature controlled area. Under 55 degrees and above 75, the worms will get lethargic and they'll stop eating as much food waste because that's not their ideal temperature range. They are living beings and they do have their favorite temperatures. Um, they will also start to die outside of their ideal temperature range. So it's best to keep it in a temperature controlled area.